So we are in the uh, Lam Rim on the stage of the highest motivation, the great scope. And we've entered into the six far reaching attitudes generosity, ethics, patience. And now we're at number four, which is, uh, could be translate a couple different ways. Usually it's joyous effort. Uh, it could also be enthusiastic perseverance. Uh, I often used to think of it as just plain old perseverance that ultimately will become a joyous effort. Uh, <laughs> but at first it's kind of willpower. And with all the um, far-reaching attitudes, we want to remember at this stage of the path, we're in a Mahayana motivation. We're in a motivation that says, this is to liberate myself and all beings. This is to remove the suffering of the world. That everything I do is an opportunity to cultivate that path to remove suffering for all beings. And so the Mahayana approach at this point at this stage of the path that's imbuing everything is a motivation to really remove suffering yourself and others the um, the approach it, when we think about Buddhism that really uh, we want to maintain uh, as a part of our pure clear purpose is why are we here right we talked about that the other day why are we here Why are you here tonight? You know what brought you here. How much of our life do we just get up and go through the next day? <laughs> now we don't even think about why am I here. We think about what can I do to have some fun. You know what can you know what kind of breakfast would I like? You know what's there to do later? Um, and how often do we sit there and remind ourselves why am I here? Why am I choosing to do something like this tonight? From a Buddhist point of view, we're looking at uh, understanding this opportunity of a rare and precious human rebirth that you have. It has 18 specific qualities. We've gone through this. But the, the nutshell of those 18 specific qualities comes down to you have, through all of these lifetimes, cultivated the amount of merit to become enlightened and very few human beings have this it's not it's not a human rebirth it's a rare and precious human rebirth you have all these qualities you have i mean when you think about all the humans out there uh, how many of them are thinking about going to a dharma teaching on wednesday night not that many of all the human beings out there, how many even have access to even reading and writing, let alone an opportunity and freedom to go seek out a teaching or a spiritual path? And then of all those who actually have all those resources that have, you know, education and libraries and can read and write, how many of them are spending a little bit of time thinking about what's the real source of their suffering and how can I improve my life? Or thinking about, you know, the jacuzzi or the next cool car or the nice house. A rare and precious human rebirth is that uh, we have all of the conditions that are ripe right now to obtain enlightenment. You have uh, even an attraction to that path. You actually asked yourself the question, why am I here? That there's something that's uncomfortable. There's something that says, you know, there's more to life than feeling good at, all the time or trying to feel good. That, that recipe's not working so well. There's much more to life. Uh, you know, we're going to have this opportunity and we're going to do some things, but at the core there's something deeper in this life there's something deeper and there's a source of suffering that, that comes a longing that says you know what's, what's the real deal here what's it all about and so with the, this life that we have and that question that we have we've been drawn to 
the question that says, how do I remove suffering from myself and others? Is it really necessary that I get angry, frustrated, resentful, and jealous? Is that necessary? <coughs> and the Buddhist would say, no, it's totally unnecessary. As a matter of fact, it's not a natural state of being to have anger, resentment, jealousy, frustration, and all the mental and emotional suffering that we have in our life. It's not necessary. He looked at this <clears throat> natural sort of what we get ex used to of aging, sickness, death, and, and uh, rebirth. And, and he looked and said, is this necessary? And what's the really root of this? And, and he came to uh, his path and journey to find out that it wasn't necessary, totally unnecessary. And he said, if you don't want to suffer, uh, you don't have to. Which is quite phenomenal because we're kind of conditioned to think, yeah, you got to suffer. Right? It's just the natural state of being. Everybody gets angry. Everybody gets, you know, we get, and he said, no, nah, you know, it's really not necessary. It's a part of a conditioned existence that we have right now. Uh, but we can actually look at the real source of our suffering. And if we recognize its source, no cause, no result. You can see the true nature. And, and the source is really that we don't see clearly. Our real source is that we don't identify with reality as it is. We identify with John. <laughs> We identify with all the wrong things. We identify with our fears, our resentments. We had, you know, I identify with John, you know, and I'm a parent and I'm a grandparent and I'm a teacher and I'm this. It's that we identify with a sense of self that doesn't exist and, and see a world in a way that it doesn't exist. The real core root of suffering is a misperception of who I am and who you are and the nature of things. And he said, if you just start seeing, you know, everything about Buddhism is to see things accurately. That's, that's really the source of Buddhism. It's see things accurately, see the world as it is. And if we recognize our true nature and the way things are, we are liberated. We are right now conditioned and limited because of our karma, our mental afflictions, and this sense of who John is, who's separate and different from you. And... So if we remember that, that everything in this opportunity right now in a rare and precious human rebirth is I can actually lift that veil. I can actually in this lifetime see things accurately and be limited, be uh, eliminate, eliminate the conditioned qualities that, uh, that just propel me to suffer, you know, to go from one thing to the next, that impulses, desires, mental afflictions, anger, frustration, sadness, attachment, and aversion that just propel me from one thing to another. And we know what that's like, you know. We're just blown from one thought to another. I'm thinking about this, and I want to be thinking about that. <laughs> I'm worrying about this, and I really would rather be doing that. That we can sit here and say very clearly, I really don't want to worry about this. And your mind will say, well, yeah, we're going to worry about this. That... Um, that mental affliction that just is impulsive and reactive and um, and we can sit there in our best best of intention and go, I'm going to live differently today and then I don't I want to be a kind person and then I wind up yelling at somebody <laughs> I want to be a patient person and I get impatient I want to be uh, a nurturing person and I become uh, an intolerant person. What's that about? I just made up my mind I'm going to be a kind, nurturing person. I'm going to do that today. And then I'm on the freeway flipping people off, you know. How'd that happen? How'd that happen? So if we really start to recognize and remember, you know, why are we here? And how about we're here to discover our true nature? that we're here in this opportunity, that we've created all the conditions to, to become fully enlightened, to uh, remove suffering, to cultivate my highest potentials. And if that seems like too big a task, well, let's start at a very simple thing. How about I'm here to start to learn how to see things more accurately? You know, to see things more accurately. 
They're real simple ways, just starting with real simple ways. Uh, and to start recognize for number one, that the source of my mental and emotional suffering is not out there. You know, that's the big per pervasive delusion that my emotional suffering, anger, resentment, jealousy, frustration, etc., is because of you or because of what's happening or the events of my life. It's just pervasive. We really think that that person is pissing me off. <laughs> and that's not the source of your suffering. That's a condition from which my mental <laughs> affliction of anger can arise. But where's my anger? It can only be one place, my mind. It's not out there. But I really think if you'd buck up and act that the way I would like you to, my life would be better. And I would be happier. So if we start seeing things a little more accurately, which is that my mind is where my mental and emotional conditions exist. It exists in my mind. My anger's here. It's not there. And... Uh, so, how do I start remembering that uh, my suffering isn't coming from what's happening, it's coming from me not wanting it to happen? <laughs> I mean, why do we really suffer? We really suffer because I don't want things to be the way they are. And then my mind will tell me stories about how it should be different. How does that make any sense? How, I think it should be different. Like I'm the center of the universe and creator of all things. It should be different. And my mind's making up that story. It's, it's nowhere else but my mind that says it should be different. There's a reason that something happened, right? I bet you whatever happened, there's a cause for it. There's a reason. And it doesn't mean I like the reason. But there's a cause for it. And my mental affliction is coming from uh, thinking things should be different than they are. And then mislabeling how things are. And seeing things inaccurately. And, and, you know, we've talked about these things many times. I'm just reiterating a few things. We've got a few new people here, too. But everything that you experience, you experience in a conditioned way. Right? So... You know, my favorite analogy is uh, is delicious, right? Somebody says, well, that's a delicious meal. It's a delicious pie. I had a delicious uh, banana split at Gannon's Ice Cream in central New York, Syracuse. Good stuff. But is that delicious, right? Where's the delicious? <coughs> the delicious is not in the ice cream. Right? The delicious is only one place. Here, not there. Whatever it is, like I had some ice cream that I liked, somebody else didn't like. As a matter of fact, there's a lady, uh, the reverend of the, the place I was at, she didn't like Gannon's ice cream. I loved Gannon's ice cream. She didn't like Gannon's ice cream. Where's the delicious, right? It's not in the ice cream. I experience deliciousness when that thing that I label ice cream comes into my mouth. <laughs> That's accurate, much more accurate than saying that is delicious. But we really think that there's this world outside that is a certain way, that that person's tall in relation to what? <laughs> that, you know, this uh, strawberries are good for you, right? I like that one. If you're allergic to strawberries, they're not very good for you. That the world that we live in is not some concrete outer world that exists in a certain way. Everything you experience is subjective and relational. Now that's just accurate. You don't need to be a Buddhist for that. That's just accurate. The world we experience is subjective and relational. And it has a lot more to do with me than you. Right? When I'm sick and tired and achy, you can be very annoying. <laughs> when I'm healthy and in a good mood, suddenly you're very interesting. Uh, when I'm uh, sick, that same food that I find delicious is not delicious at all. 
My favorite song after the thousandth time in a row is not so fun. We have to, we get this now if we talk, but the world we experience is not some concrete world where this is that. It's not. When I change, everything else changes. When I change, everything else changes. And my, pers my perspective of things has an influence on whether that, that guy is cool or that guy's not cool. Because <laughs> that person's not cool or not cool, <laughs> right? And they're generally cool if I like them and they're saying things I appreciate. And they, you know, they have my values. Well, then they're all right. And if they don't, they're clearly an idiot, right? So all day long, we walk around in this world where we, we see this world and we think this is that and that person's like this and that's, and here's the way it should be and, and all these things and try to collect a lot of pleasurable experiences and then we die. <laughs> And somewhere along the line, you know, maybe you had some good times in there. <laughs> and then your life's over. And what's the point? The Buddha said, you know, the point is um, that if we can start paying attention to how things are instead of my mislabeling, misperceiving. Well, number one, just right off the bat, you, without again being a Buddhist, just a normal human being, you're going to suffer less. You're going to suffer because you're going to suffer less because there's no reason to suffer if you see things accurately. The suffering's in my mind. It's not out there. If I start to recognize this, I can start working on the source of my suffering. And the source of my suffering is a misperception which tells me that I will be happy if. And I'll be really miserable if. And then I'll spend my whole life trying to, to get the things I want and try to avoid the things I don't want. And just try to get everyone to do what I would like. And, uh, and try not to be sick and try not to get in accidents and try not to get laid off from jobs and try not to, you know, all these conditions that are life. But if I understand that life are these conditions, then I can deal with them more accurately. And so as we go in here, if we get to, and where I'm going to joyous effort now, is the idea that you do not get to see things accurately just because. <laughs> you don't find inner peace, well-being, tranquility, and enlightenment just because. You certainly don't find it just getting out of bed, looking for breakfast, and finding the next fun thing to do today. As a matter of fact, that's the recipe for a lot of suffering. <laughs> You know, the very things that we we fall into a trap that I'm going to be happy if. Um, and then, if that's true, if that's true, uh, if that really wonderful vacation is going to make me happy, how come I'm not happy after the wonderful vacation? How come I'm still prone to being stressed, angry, resentful, frustrated, and impatient? I just had a great vacation. The vacation came and went, and I'm still here. We want to think about, well, if I want inner peace, well-being, tranquility, or even enlightenment, even if I'm not to the enlightened part, I just want inner peace and well-being, how is that going to happen if I don't do something? <laughs> so acquire it. In other words, if I want uh, a nice paycheck for a job, right? Well, do I just want the paycheck, you know, and I don't want to go to the job. <laughs> if I want a college degree, I got to go to college. If I want inner peace, well-being, and happiness, well, I got to do something. I got to create the causes for it. If I don't have a cause, I won't have the result. And what's the real cause of genuine happiness, well-being, inner peace? Are doing uh, virtuous activities and things that lead to wisdom. Basically, the whole path: wisdom, seeing things more accurately, and merit. So everything in our life, we can be accumulating those two things: merit, positive potential, virtuous activity, creating the conditions that I'm going to feel good about. And even again, not as a Buddhist. 
your grandmother will tell you if you want to be happy, you do things you feel good about. <laughs> if I live a life of integrity, I'll feel good about who I am. That's just ethics. That's virtuous activity. When I do things, I'm going to feel better. There's no Buddhism in that. That's just truth. You want inner peace, you do things you feel good about. You know why you don't have inner peace? Because I do things I don't feel good about. <laughs> I feel bad. There's a, a friend of mine once told me, he said, uh, you, you know why you feel guilty? No, why? He says, well, because you usually are. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I feel bad because I did things I don't feel good about. <laughs> and when I do things I feel good about, I feel good. It's, it's just straightforward, simple. It's not rocket science. The source of all happiness is from virtuous activity. The source of all unhappiness, non-virtuous activity. Straight Buddhist principle, but it's a universal principle. You may have heard it in a different way. You reap what you sow, right? True throughout the time of, of ages, of wisdom, of religions, we reap what we sow. I do things I feel good about, I feel good. I do things I don't feel good about, I don't feel good. And when I don't feel good, I'll start doing a whole bunch of other things to feel good. <laughs> and I'll start doing a lot of activities, some of which are not very healthy or very helpful. Right? Escapes, you know. Uh, and these are all bandages to prevent me from actually dealing with the real root of why I don't feel good. I don't feel good because I'm not doing things I feel good about. And I'm not whole and I'm not well. When I fill this up, I don't need to go do those other things. So when we come into this joyous effort part, there's three types of, uh, of joyous effort or enthusiastic perseverance. First type is this armor-like, armor-like joyous effort. It's a, it's a strength. It's this... Uh, really a palpable energetic force that you can develop and and you get it because you know that this leads towards the life you want that it's purposeful that it's meaningful that it's leading you in a direction of enlightenment it's what sustains us when everything's going the opposite way right when hardship and challenges that come up in life. Well, I know I'm going to take the, the path that, that leads to health and happiness. And with that kind of effort, it's, it's an interesting thing because it comes into the idea that, uh, I think it was Helen Keller. Helen Keller, I like a lot of Helen Keller. She's a very strong woman, a wise woman, right? Through, uh, and she, I, I, I believe, I could be misquoting, but I think it was her uh, who's, and, you know, other people have said it, but to think of all life as an adventure. All life is an adventure. Hey, what's today got to bring? And, you know, if it's uh, bringing me hardship and challenges, well, what's the adventure? How do I overcome this? How do I deal with this? How do I grow from it? Because when life doesn't go our way, that's when we get to grow up, right? I didn't develop any of my good qualities in life because somebody told me it would be a good idea. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I just didn't work that way. Maybe some of you have. I have not. My greatest points of growth and clarity and <coughs> wisdom in life came from hitting a wall, <laughs> from pain. And, and that's the thing, you know, people... Uh, we want to avoid pain, and I think it's a good idea to avoid pain. And we should try, and if you're not trying to avoid pain, I think there's a problem, <laughs> actually. But pain has a purpose. Pain has a purpose in our life. Pain tells us what's wrong, right? When I get an injury in my knee and it hurts, it tells me I need to see a doctor. There's something wrong when I'm sick. There's something wrong. When we have emotional pain, there's something wrong. There's something to look at. Pain has a purpose. Pain lets us know what we have to work on, whether it's a physical pain or a mental pain or emotional pain. Uh, Scott Peck, uh, you know, just straight psychology, has the, uh, 
a thesis that says all mental emotional sort of neurosis comes from avoiding legitimate pain. So there's some pain that we need to experience, right? When we have a loss of someone, it's sad. And we have sadness. Well, if I don't want to feel the sadness, <laughs> I'm going to do some things to avoid it. Now I'm creating mental and emotional suffering through escape, through other behaviors and activities that are not very healthy because I don't want to deal with feeling uncomfortable. I don't want to feel legitimate pain, legitimate pain. When we uh, understand that life has normal pains that come with it. Everyone you know will come and go, right? We're all going to get sick. Uh, you know, we might break a leg. This is the life. Uh, if I can understand that, well, I can take this armor-like joyous effort and go, well, how can I grow from it? How can I move through this pain in a way that's beneficial? Because that's when I get to grow. How do we learn to be tolerant? We learn tolerance from the intolerant. <laughs> How do we learn patience? How do we learn compassion? How do we learn these qualities in our lives? Except through adversity. So that adversity becomes the great opportunity to grow. It becomes the door to enlightenment. All living beings become the source of our enlightenment. The difficulties and challenges and the hardships that come are actually opportunities to purify negative karmic imprints. <laughs> you know, I mean, I really think when I break a leg, I'm really happy. I think, man, I got rid of that karma. <laughs> it's done. And I've purified. It's a different mentality. It says, you know, my car gets hit. Wow, that's great. Nobody got injured. <laughs> it's a dent in the car and that karma's gone. these opportunities in life become not pleasant <coughs> at the time, but opportunities to grow. When uh, hardship and challenges and uh, difficulties in life come, they become opportunities to grow. So this armor-like joyous effort becomes this strength that says, you know what? I've done this before. If I look back at my life, when this happened, it was the worst day of my life. And you know what? And when I look back at it, it helped me change. It became the best day of my life. When I look at my own life, the real pain and suffering and demoralizing things that I did in my life allowed me to be the person I am today. And I didn't learn right away. <laughs> I mean, I hurt a lot of people and I did a lot of damage. And I did it for a long time. At some point, it got to the point where I couldn't look in the mirror, and it gave me the epiphany and the realization that my suffering came from me, not you. And then 31 years of a different path of a spiritual journey. So this armor-like joyous effort is that, that first we get it from understanding the strength that we get from doing the next right thing from doing the thing that is healthiest, that's beneficial, from responding to life's events in a way that cultivates merit and wisdom. With merit and wisdom, I'm achieving enlightenment. That everything that happens in my life is an opportunity to make the most out of my life. Now, we don't get it just right away. <laughs> yeah, But if we, you know, again, we take some time you know, that's what the Lam Rim teachings are, is to reflect on these key points and realize that, you know, every time I did an action that was ethical and had integrity, I feel pretty good about that. I feel pretty good about that. I was just on a, a, some flights. I was with this guy. He was a 20-year Air Force veteran major actually at one point and he had just uh, flown out and um, and his uh, his brother was going through the, the loss of his wife so his wife was in hospice and he was by the bedside and um, it was pretty interesting he told the story his brother 
uh, there are five weeks. You know, they didn't know when she would pass. They did the bucket list, you know, right? Get her to all the things that she, she wanted to do. And then uh, they got her to the place where she wanted to pass. And, uh, and they got her a bed, and, and it was five weeks. And, and he stayed there. He got a bed there. And he was with her every day for five weeks. And um, he wanted to be there when she passed. And he came out to be with his brother. His brother said, you don't need to be here. I can't entertain you, you know. He said, You're not, I'm not here for you to entertain me. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. You're my brother. You're my little brother. And I'm here for you. And uh, it was a, just a really amazing story because he, um, he was a great husband. He sat there for those five weeks. And he was with her all the way to the end. And eventually it passed while, while this gentleman was out there. And, you know, it just really brings to life the, the story that um, it wasn't fun to lose the wife. But that man will always feel he did the best and will feel good about that process of letting her go and being there and being there every night. His brother Jim, who I was with, said, you know, it certainly wasn't what I planned when I came out, but I am really glad I was there for my little brother. And we are now so much closer. He's been calling him every day, and they had drifted apart. Now they're so much more connected. The hardships in our life that we think are so terrible and so devastating are actually the time that our highest potentials are reached if we choose to show up for them. So in order to really develop this armor-like joyous effort, we need to remember this and be able to have that well to draw from that, yeah, this sucks right now. This really sucks. But this is an opportunity for me to cultivate some higher potentials, to look out for something bigger than myself, to cultivate merit and wisdom. And that's always the question. How do I cultivate merit and wisdom here? And so we had this beautiful talk, and uh, he was a, a wonderful man, and we got to spend a few hours on a plane together. The second kind of uh, joyous effort is, uh, it kind of leads right into that, is the effort of accumulating, um, how is it, of doing virtuous action, of doing good things, right? Because we're going to feel good when we do, do virtuous things. So it's really accumulating merit. And, uh, and that that is already an, a pretty easy reward. You know, we, um, the armor-like, we really need to look at those difficult situations and really develop that. Uh, the joyous effort of doing uh, these virtuous activities, it's a process, but, but it's an immediate reward. Like, you feel good usually pretty much right away when you do virtuous things, when you're a benefit, when you're helpful. Um, there's a reward. It's not always there right away. You know, a friend of mine was talking, what was the analogy she used was the neighbor, an old neighbor, uh, and, um, and they'd go mow their yard. They'd mow their yard, and some days they didn't feel like mowing their yard, <laughs> and they didn't feel like the neighbor appreciated it sometimes, and it became, a, you know, a bit of a thing. And she said, you know, I don't, I'm doing, I'm mowing the yard, but, you know, I'm not feeling genuinely happy about that. And I said, really? Why do you mow the yard? She said, well, I feel like it's the right thing to do. So my next question was, how would you feel if you didn't mow the yard? I wouldn't feel very good. So even though you're not enjoying doing something that's virtuous at the time, I'll tell you what, you're going to feel a lot better than not doing it. <laughs> and she living in a way that she felt good about. It doesn't feel good at the moment, but it certainly feels a lot better than not doing it and feeling bad about it. And the idea of um, over time continuing to have your actions reflect your values. You're going to feel good about it. The third one is, I'm going to scoot along because I want to get to laziness. Uh <laughs> The third one is uh, is really uh, the joyous effort of benefiting all beings, you know, of, of really being a benefit. And this comes into that that bodhicitta aspiration that we talk about is that everything I do can help all beings. So the more that I am able to cultivate the qualities of enlightenment, the more I can help everybody, right? Uh, if
if I become an enlightened being, I can do a lot more than, uh, than if I'm not. And that all the activities that are leading me towards uh, merit and, and wisdom for enlightenment gives me an opportunity to be helpful to everybody else so that everything I do can be for everybody else. And there's a real joyous effort. It's a thing that gets you out of bed in the morning. It says, wow, just by me being a better human being just made the world a better place. And it does. That everything that I do that is beneficial, working towards uh, merit and wisdom, improves the world that we live in and improves the life of all beings. And that I can be doing that every day. It's a good reason to get out of bed. Maybe I don't want to get out for me, but I'll get out of bed for you. Because doing the next you know, beneficial thing makes this world a better place. And for me, I really, that's one of my, my own personal quotes is thinking that when we get overwhelmed and we think that there's just so much nonsense in the world and that, you know, my little part doesn't make a difference and that you can't really improve much. Well, I like to remind people that you can always improve yourself and improving yourself, you just made the world a better place. And we do that. And everyone can do that. And it has a ripple effect. So this really wonderful, joyous effort around obtaining enlightenment for the welfare of all beings, that, that this is a journey. It's a long-term goal. You know, there's today, but there's this year and the next year. And if you look back at your life, you can see how you've grown over a year or two years. If you look at a continuum in Buddhism, we think we have eons of lifetimes, that we're in this for the long haul. And in the long haul, all of you have created through eons of lifetimes all the virtues to give you this life right now, in this moment. To be here now. To have all the qualities for enlightenment. And you can continue that. And so, this is a sacred, precious life with all the qualities for enlightenment for all sentient beings. And if you take care of it, you can help everybody. That kind of effort, that everything I do can help everybody. Every virtuous thought I have can help everybody. Every stupid thing I do, I can learn from <laughs> and help everybody. Uh, that kind of beautiful, joyous effort. So these are these three sort of, sort of aspects of, of joyous effort. And the reason there's effort there is because these things don't happen on their own. Left to our own devices, if we don't create a cause, we don't get there. If we don't put in the effort to cultivate merit and wisdom. So merit is really positive potential. It's doing things that are virtuous in a way that creates conditions for the welfare of yourself and others. Wisdom is always bringing our mind back to reality as much as possible and seeing how things actually are. You know, I am not the same John that was here yesterday. It sure feels like it is, though, doesn't it? But I'm not. And I have the potential to improve all the time, which we forget sometimes. And the world that I live in is subjective and conditioned by my karma. If I remember that, I remember that if I want to improve my life and the lives around me, what do I change? Me, not you. Everything I experience is through a lens of my karma. As my karma changes, everything else changes. Everything else changes. And so the wisdom is start to see how my misperceptions about reality create suffering. Okay, so... The three marks of existence, impermanence. Everything's impermanent. Everything's changing all the time. That's a funny one that we get locked into. We really try to make things not change. Uh, that there's nothing outside of yourself that will provide you any lasting happiness. There's nothing out there that will. Nothing. Nothing. And there is no John here. <laughs> In the sense that there's this physical being labeled John, but whatever's John is changing all the time. That 
there's no one John that doesn't change, that non-self, that sense that I am only, uh, whatever qualities I have are changeable and there's uh, and I'm very fluid and that these qualities change all the time in independence upon what's happening and what I'm doing. That there's no concrete John that goes day to day, that there's a fluid river of consciousness and that I show up in different ways at different times depending on the setting, right? A little while ago I was a uh, customer. You know, right now I'm a Dharma teacher. A little while ago I was a uh, pedestrian. Uh, a little while before that I was uh, a client with a hospital uh, and you know so forth. All these labels arise and as a matter of fact just before a call just a few minutes before I came out my daughter was calling me about uh, wedding dates you know asking you know if I'd walk her up the aisle and do these different things in which case I was the proud dad and then I came out and now I'm a Dharma teacher and now when I'm leaving, I'll be a pedestrian. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, not that long ago, I was on a plane being the annoying guy next to this lady. Uh, <laughs> all the other planes I got on, we had these nice conversations. I sat on the last plane here, and I I'd go, hello. And she just looked at me like, don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll sit here and meditate. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she just looked, not even a hello back, just looked up like, yeah, not, no. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right. You know, the guy before, I was the interesting guy, we got to talk about things, you know. Um, but I'm none of those things, right? And I'm all those things, but, but what I am is interdependent with you, and what's happening all the time. So if I start to understand that, I can see this label of John more accurately, uh, which will come up here in laziness. So, so what prevents us from, from having an effort that says, hey, it makes sense, right? If I start showing up every day knowing this day will never come again and that I have Buddha nature to become enlightened and I've got all these qualities and that I can start doing things more accurately and not suffering and that all the suffering is really created in my own mind that I can change all that, why don't I do it? It makes sense, why not? Because we're lazy. And, and I'm going to say lazy in, in a Buddhist perspective. Buddhist has a very different label of laziness. One is a kind that we, we all sort of know, which is sort of procrastination. Have you ever procrastinated? <laughs> I'll do that tomorrow. You know. I'll get my life together. You know, I might do that retreat thing next year. You know, there's things. Where, you know, there's a nice vacation. Uh, uh, you know, there's a concert this weekend. We procrastinate, we put things off, but but it's also a laziness, you know, like I'll do the dishes tomorrow, you know, around the couch. There's, so there's a, a sort of label of laziness that we're kind of used to that, you know, says, yeah, I'll, uh, you know, I'll get to that. Um, and it's pretty chronic in us. Right now, I just want to feel good. You know, I'll, I'm going to watch the end of this movie and, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll fold the laundry tomorrow. I'll go to that Dharma teaching next time. You know that book. You know I've had that book. I'm going to read that book. Really. It's a great book. It's, one day I'll unwrap it. Um, <laughs> I was at this retreat this last weekend with a bunch of guys in recovery. <laughs> and uh, he, got, he had the, the book. And uh, it was free. He said it took him three years to read the first chapter. Because he would look at the book. It was under the TV. It was right there. Uh, and uh, but he never read the book. And, and and he and he did that weekend. He sat out with a guy and read read the first chapter. He said, "Yeah, it took him an hour and a half." He said, "But it took him three years and an hour and a half <laughs> <laughs> to read the book." <laughs> so there's all this stuff we know would be healthy, but we don't do it because we procrastinate. There's a state of laziness. So the antidote to that 
is something we talk about all the time. What's the antidote to laziness, to the procrastination, is you're going to die, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's the meditation on death, that I can go at any time. There's nothing to say I'll be here tomorrow. Death is certain, time of death uncertain. You know, I think I got all this time. But you have a rare and precious human rebirth. You have all the qualities for enlightenment, and you could die tonight. And that's just the way it is. And it's to remember that, that this day will never come again. And every day that we're alive, we're one day closer to our death. So that book that you want to read tomorrow, well, you may not be here tomorrow. <laughs> and this day is never coming again. And this opportunity and this moment's never coming again. If we do a real Lamrin nine-point meditation on death, you do that regularly, you remember that this day is not going to come again. That's a really good antidote to procrastination. <laughs> which brings us to the second form of laziness, which is, I think, what we mostly all suffer from, is an attachment to busyness, <laughs> to doing things, to the, to the happiness of this life to trying to make this life really fun and wonderful. And, uh, and that's the real form of... It's funny, real busy people are actually, by a Buddhist point of view, really lazy people. They're doing all these things. They're working three jobs. They're getting that college degree. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're building a new house. But you know what they're not doing is cultivating wisdom or a Dharma practice or meditation. And they're not making any stride at all in... in really getting to the core of their suffering because they're busy all the time doing stuff. And then they have a heart attack at 50. And they never took the time to ask themselves, why am I here? What's meaningful in life? How can I really be of benefit in this lifetime? That, uh, uh, that laziness is a busyness. And it's that busyness that is, is also tied into just the simple pleasures, right? Because, you know, that movie, the popcorn and the ice cream, are all going to come and go. <laughs> are you any better off? Are you any better off? You know? Got to... If we're not making the time to take the time to make this day meaningful, we're being really lazy. We're not taking the time to meditate and take control of my mind. We're being lazy. We can be doing a million other things out there. We can go do that really cool concert. That's great. That'll come and go. And guess what? You're still able to be upset, angry, frustration, resentful. And we're not saying don't go do the concert or don't watch the TV or don't have popcorn. I mean, I like popcorn with butter and salt and nutritional <laughs> yeast. <laughs> I like popcorn a lot. But that popcorn's not going to help me gain any wisdom. But it could. <laughs> right? And that's the difference. So we're lazy in the sense that we're not taking the time to make our life a Dharma practice. And you can make your whole life a Dharma practice. But that means you actually have to be aware of it. <laughs> And if your mind is so preoccupied and busy and distracted with all of these things that outside circumstances and things and activities and busyness, we don't take the time to remember that this day won't come again. And my opportunity to be truly happy and beneficial comes from how I live my life and what's meaningful. And that every activity I engage in, I could be asking the question, how can this be beneficial? How can I learn from this? How can I help others? And everything can be like that. Eating popcorn, right? I can eat popcorn with an attitude of gratitude around the fact that I have this incredible opportunity to eat organic popcorn. And all the beans, you know, having said a prayer for all beans that, that help make this possible, including the funds to get it, and eat it in a way to nourish my body so I can be healthy and well so I can help others, so that I can do my practice. And then eating becomes a Dharma practice. Or I could just shovel a bunch of popcorn in my mouth and watch TV, right? <laughs> 
and not even know it's gone. Like, really, where'd it go? <laughs> it's empty. What happened? You've been in my bag, you know. <coughs> I mean, so much of our food, we're not even there for when we eat. And so we have this, this busyness uh, that is actually a laziness because it just prevents us from making our life meaningful. Third one is uh, one we suffer from a lot, and one I'd hope to talk more about. We'll see uh, how we get there. Is the laziness of not feeling good enough. We don't do things because we don't feel we're good enough. We don't feel like, you know, that's for other people. Other people can get enlightened. Other people can be better people. Other people, but I'm not me, you know. And, and we beat ourselves up, right? If, um, uh, if I'm doing my mala, prayers for all sentient beings, or you actually have a person that I'm saying prayers for for you know, a specific amount of time, and I fall asleep and wake up, man, I can't even do this right. How am I ever going to become enlightened? You know, I can't even meditate for 10 minutes. How the heck am I ever going to be enlightened? You know, I go to these retreats, I have loving kindness, and I just yell at my kid, and I just lose my temper. What kind of a jerk am I? And we forget to be thoughtful about who and what we are. Because we just did a hundred wonderful things, and I did one thing. <laughs> I yelled at somebody, which crosses out all the hundred good things I just did. The fact that I'm trying to be a better human being is important. And so we have this sometimes concept, this laziness of we don't try because we don't think we can, we're not good enough. And what we need to remember is that all of us, all of you here, have Buddha nature. You have fully enlightened qualities already there. All of you have the qualities of enlightenment right now. And the only thing preventing us from seeing those is our own mental afflictions and karma. As you clear that, all of the other stuff comes out. You all have it. You're all good enough. You are all good enough. You are all fully capable of being enlightened. And the only thing is a mountain of karma and obscurations and mental afflictions that prevent us and you know that when you clear away, it comes out. And all of us have that opportunity, and all of us can change, and all of us can improve all the time. I was at this retreat with a bunch of men in recovery, most of which have spent quite a bit of time in, in prison, and who have done incredibly harmful things to people. And these are men, most of which with quite a bit of time in recovery, who are sharing a weekend at a retreat center, learning to meditate and be better men. And all of them are telling these incredible stories. One of the ones that was most touching uh, was sharing, and these, you know, they're crying because of the life they had. I mean, there's a guy there who didn't know how to read when he got when he got clean, and uh, today he's like in charge of a multi-million dollar business <laughs> and handles contracts. And he was sitting out there was another man, the guy who had waited three years to read the book, teaching him how to read a chapter at one in the morning and crying, remembering that he couldn't read at one time and at the life that they have, that we can change. This, this one guy was telling me, he's sitting there with his mom and he went up to church, they have a church there, and he said he remembers being at church and his mom crying uh, with the joy that she's got her son back the son who had gone to prison, and he said, my mom doesn't have any jewelry anymore because of me. But my mom told me, I don't care about that, I have my son. My son's a good man. And that same man was driving his kid to college and dropping him off. And he's clean, and he's changed. All of us, no matter where we're at, have an incredible amount of potential that we don't know about because... We're, it's just covered up. But every day is an opportunity to be better than we were yesterday. And if we continue on this path with the effort, we're more than good enough. And we have potential we haven't even imagined yet. 
You know, we had 36 men, and every one of their stories, you know, was just imagine, just amazing. And, and to be there, it was an honor to be with these guys who were honorable men, who were learning how to be husbands and fathers and, uh, and crying with each other and for each other and, and sitting up there at one in the morning helping this guy read a book. And, uh, and that that, he says, was more, you know, just valuable. We all have all this incredible potential. So these three forms of laziness, there's things to be aware of. So there's antidotes. The first two, laziness or procrastination, laziness of the busyness and the attraction to worldly stuff, it's the same thing. The antidote is you're going to die. <laughs> and those things that we get so attached to, how important are they to you? How much are they going to change your life, really? So to take some time, and it's not that you don't do them, but it's to take the time and say, here's a day that will never come again. What's really meaningful? What do I engage in? What's a balanced life look like? There's some time to recreate, you know. But I can recreate in a way that's meaningful. I keep thinking about you guys going to Italy and thinking about how you went with the idea of, you know, offering uh, you know, to engage with people in a way that was meaningful and the whole trip became more meaningful. And everything can be Dharma practice. My work can be Dharma practice. But we need to be there and consciously be doing it instead of it's just a whole bunch of stuff we did and then it's over and now what do I do? The third one which is thinking I'm not good enough and so I don't try is remembering our Buddha nature your incredible quality of change and improvement that's always there if we can be aware of these forms of laziness and apply the antidotes that here's a day that will never come again here's an opportunity to cultivate the qualities of enlightenment in everything I do it becomes a liberating quality of a joyous effort that always bears the question in this situation what's the healthiest thing I can do you know it doesn't have to be some big esoteric wisdom teaching what's the way what's the thing that I'll feel good about tomorrow how can I respond in this way that I'll feel good about tomorrow what's healthy what's meaningful so every day those four thoughts that turn your mind to dharma, right? We have a conditioned existence that we can't find happiness in. You have this rare and precious human rebirth that allows you enlightenment. You won't have it forever. <laughs> it's, it's impermanent. It's going to come and go. And at the time of this physical end, the only thing that's going to help you in life is how you lived it, your karma. So the real essence of this life that it all comes back to with joyous effort is what are you doing karmically? We all know how much money we have in the checkbook, but are we keeping track of how I'm living my life, what my motivations are, how helpful I'm being? That's what matters at the t when this body comes and goes. What goes to the next life is my karma. All of my seeds of consciousness continue in this stream and the real essence of my life is how I lived my life that goes with you how I treated others how I treated my neighbor how I showed up at work what I did with with the people in my life and how I lived my life that becomes the effort so as we bring our mind into this far-reaching attitude of joyous effort there's an incredible joy that happens because you're doing the effort to alleviate suffering in your life and others and your life has purpose and meaning. You can have the armor-like effort, the effort of really joy that comes from cultivating virtuous activity that leads to happiness and then the third one that benefits all beings. And we're a few minutes over. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Hopefully that was clear. We thank you. We'll do our dedication because we have a merit and wisdom that we've accumulated here that we can benefit for all beings. And this is putting it in the ocean of merit for all sentient beings. 
Uh, but the takeaway is really when you wake up each day to remember here's a day that you can cultivate. Two, it's just that simple. What am I doing that's virtuous and what am I doing that's bringing me back to a more accurate way of living? I am not my sadness. That will come and go. <laughs> I'm not my anger. That will come and go. What's really important is how I respond and live in life more accurately. And if I change me, the world changes. Okay? Yeah, I know. You just got to do it. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, take a moment to do a dedication, to dedicate the merit and virtue for the benefit of all beings. Let us dedicate the virtue and wisdom we have accumulated both individually and collectively, both today and throughout our lives. We dedicate this merit and wisdom for the benefit of all beings. May all beings be free of suffering and find the lasting happiness. And may we be able to use the merit and wisdom accumulated here today and throughout our lives to purify our own minds, to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. Thank you all so much. Joy to be with you and to you online. Thank you so much for joining us. May you all be well, be happy, and try to stay out of trouble.